who was born in Dunfermline, Scotland, in 1837. He is reading aloud to his friend, Tom Miller. And in this way, our friend Benjamin Franklin spent his boyhood and youth until on account of some disagreement with his brother, he left his native town and went to Philadelphia. He should have come to Pittsburgh. Oh, no, you're showing your ignorance, Tom Miller. Pittsburgh wasn't even heard of then. This happened more than a hundred years ago. Ah, Tom Franklin was poor, just like we are. But he made good. He wasn't a messenger boy, though. He was a printer. That's just as bad. Printers are poorer than messengers, I know. My Uncle Angus was a printer back in Scotland. I thought he was a weaver. No, my father was a weaver. And he was poorer than Uncle Angus. You know, Andy, I don't believe a young man has a chance anymore. And why not? Well, all these modern inventions, they're putting men out of work. We've got machines for almost everything now. You have to have men to run the machines, don't you? Sure, but it isn't like back in Franklin's time. In those days, it was easy to get ahead. Not any easier than it is now. No? No, take Franklin, for instance. Well, he was poor, and he didn't have any schooling. But Tommy had brains. Well, everybody has brains. Aye, but everybody doesn't know how to use them. If you're going to use your brains, you have to read, Tom. You have to study. What if you don't have the chance? Make the chance. Well, just like we're doing. This is Saturday afternoon, isn't it? Yes, our day off. Well, what are the other fellows doing on their days off? Well, most of them go out and have a good time. Do you think reading about the life of Ben Franklin will make us successful? No, but it'll help. Now, look at this big house. Wouldn't you like to have a house like this? I'd like to have as much money as Colonel Anderson, the man that owns it. Well, Colonel Anderson's a fine man. If I had his money, I'd do just what he's doing. I'd open up my library to the whole town. Well, Tom, I'd build a public library for everybody. Yes, you would not. Well, I'll bet you a million dollars I'd do it. And I'll bet you 40 cents you wouldn't. All right, Mr. Smarty, it's a bet. When I open up my library, you're going to owe me 40 cents. <laughs> I'll wait. I don't see you giving anything away now. And it wouldn't be any different if you were a millionaire. Oh, it's easy to give things away you haven't got. But if you really had a million, well, that'd be an entirely different matter. Andrew did not long remain a messenger boy. In a few years, he was a telegraph operator for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Then he was promoted to work in the office of the superintendent. One day, while traveling from Pittsburgh to New York by train, a bright-eyed man wearing sadly wrinkled clothes plumped a green carpet bag down in the aisle beside him. Morning, sir. You mind if I sit down beside you? Uh, oh, no, 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 not at all. Plenty of room. Thanks. Hey, for Thunder. Yes, if you like to travel in the daytime. I do. I can't sleep in these coaches at night. The back of the seat's too low. If the railroad was smart. They'd put beds in their trains. <laughs> beds in a train? <laughs> ah, take up too much room. But the time will come when every night train will have beds in it. Do you think so? I know it. <laughs> hey, see here, lad. I think I know you. Aren't you Andrew Carnegie, the young man who works for Superintendent Scott? Aye, that's me. My name's Thomas Woodruff. I've been trying to talk to your boss for a long time. I'm an inventor. I've invented a special coach for a train, just like we were talking about. A sleeping coach. Oh? Now, I'd like to interest Mr. Scott, and, uh, well, you might be able to help me. Well, I might, if the invention's any good. Of course it's good. Now, I'll show you my model. It's here in my satchel. Oh, these newfangled snaps are the hardest things to open. I... There. There. Now, now look at that. The seats slide down, and that makes a bed wide enough for two people. Yes, but what are you going to do with the other two people? Watch. There's an upper berth. It swings down from the top. Oh. Simple, isn't it? But is it practical? Oh, the model speaks for itself. Every measurement is exact. Looks like a pretty good idea. Do you think you could interest your boss in it? I don't know. The superintendent's pretty wary about new inventions. He's a Scotsman. You're a Scotsman, too, aren't you? Uh, well, in a way. Well, it was easy for me to convince you. So why aren't you able to convince the superintendent? I might try. Well, if you did. And if you sold him on the worth of my invention, I might let you in on it as a partner. For how much? Oh, say, $1,200. Hmm, that's a lot of money. 
But I'll arrange for you to have a talk with Mr. Scott. And if Mr. Scott says it's all right, I'll team up with you. It'd almost be worth $1,200 to get a good night's sleep on one of these trains. As a result of this meeting, Carnegie became a partner in the Woodruff Sleeping Car Company. It was a successful venture and established the sleeping coach as an indispensable part of American transportation. It also paved the way for greater undertakings. In 1866, Carnegie and his boyhood friend, Tom Miller, organized the Pittsburgh Locomotive Works. From then on, his fortune was made. He acquired vast lands rich in oil, coal, steel. In 1899, the powerful Carnegie Steel Company was formed. One afternoon in 1900, we find him in the office of the Carnegie Steel Company in Bethlehem. His friend and associate, Charles Schwab, has just entered. Come in, Charles, come in. <laughs> J.P. Morgan's lawyer was here this morning. Yes, I know. What did he have on his mind? Just snooping about a bit. And do you know what I told him we were planning to do? Make an overture or merger with them, I suppose. What? I should say not. I told him that we were preparing to build a new plant, a tremendous production outlay. You told him that? But we have no such plan. Of course we haven't, man. But I told him that this new plant would make it possible to undersell by a great margin all three of the Morgan companies put together. I see. Well, I've just had a talk with Morgan. He wants to take an option on the Carnegie interest, steel and oil. An option? Yeah. You're not surprised that he wants to buy you out after telling his lawyer that, are you? No, but he'll get no option. He'll buy right now. And for how much? Here. I'll just write it out in figures for you. There now. Can you read that? What? $492 million? Aye, $492 million. But you do think they'll pay it? Aye, they'll pay it. And Charles, my boy, it'll be the most stupendous sale in the history of the world. At the age of 64... The boy who began life in the cottage of a poor weaver consummated the largest sale that had ever been known in the history of the world. And a few years later, we find him in the drawing room of his New York residence. Seated in a chair before him is Tom Miller, his boyhood friend. You have been a good friend to me for many years, Tom. And I thought I'd have a talk with you before... Uh, before I... Before you what? Retire from business. Re retire? That's what I said. But, Andy, you can't retire. Why not? Well, you're still a comparatively young man. You've built up the greatest corporation America's ever seen. You can't quit now. You still haven't told me why. Well, the company needs you, and the men need you. They know that you are square, and they'll play the game with you. Yes, I know that. But I'm still going to retire. Do you realize how much money I've made, Tom? Yeah, I have a vague idea. Our company's now making a clear profit of $40 million a year. By next year, the profits will probably be $60 million. Well, then why do you want to sell out? Well, I've always said that it's a disgrace for a man to die rich. And when I said it, I meant it. Yeah, but what do you intend to do, Andy? Tom, do you mind that day when we were boys together? Mind how we used to visit Colonel Anderson's library? Yes, I do. That library was just for working boys. And I said then that someday I'd build a library for everyone. You can't give all that money to a library. No, but I can build libraries all over the United States, all over the world, in fact. Oh, sure. That's it. That isn't all, Tom. It'll take me the rest of my life to spend what I've made. Spend it in the right way. The first thing I'm going to do is take care of the men who helped me to make that fortune. Uh, the men in the mills. Right. I'm going to provide them with a, a relief fund. One that will ensure them against accident and poverty and old age. They'll appreciate it, Andy. But even if you carry out these plans, we we'll still have plenty left. I can find lots of ways to distribute wealth. I can establish schools and colleges. I can help science to fight diseases. You know, spending that money is going to be twice as exciting as earning it. 
Yeah, but it won't be half as hard. <laughs> Tom, at last I know what people need more than anything else. What? Understanding. That's the answer to everything. Yeah, perhaps it is. People should learn to understand one another, Tom. And not only that, they should be able to understand the world they live in. There's a great deal to learn, Tom. Not only from books, but from nature. Yeah, well, some people don't want to learn. And that's their own fault. A man doesn't have to stay buried in the bottom of a coal mine. He can come up on the top. He can enjoy the world. God made it for him. It's his to know and to have. You're an idealist, Andy. Just like you were years ago. You made millions. Now you're going to give them away to an ideal. A library. <laughs> and you said I wouldn't. You had to call that? <laughs> yes. It was the day we were sitting on Colonel Anderson's front steps, reading about Benjamin Franklin. Mm -hmm. And if my memory serves me right, you made me a little bet that day. <laughs> Yes, so I did. Well then, Mr. Miller, I may be an idealist, but I'm still a Scotsman. How about paying me that 40 cents? As a captain of industry, Andrew Carnegie's fame has been great. But, as a philanthropist, an educator, and a friend to man, his name will live on through the centuries. We thus pay homage to Andrew Carnegie, a Scotchman by birth, an industrialist by profession, gentleman by nature. Captain of Industry.